So now is the uh, the second session, which will talk about disease states and uh, when things go wrong and stuff that uh, uh, you and us we deal with on a daily basis. So we've had a fairly firm and very academic grounding in the anatomic and physiologic constructs of GI tract. Now we can move forward with the disease states. So uh, this particular section talks about esophageal and foregut diseases, so to speak. Uh, to some extent, um, and then and then we go down the track uh, as Bill mentioned. Uh, gastroesophageal re reflux disease is probably one of the most common uh, ICD diagnoses in America. Um, it's basically uh, you know used in many different ways in terms of uh, expression, in terms of discussion, definition. But what it really is 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 reflux of content acid or non-acid content across the lower esophageal sphincter, which we discussed earlier, right here, the GE junction, back from the stomach into the esophagus and creates all kinds of uh, misery for, uh, for a lot of people. So that's really the, the essential definition, but you'll hear patients say a lot of different ways, you know, I have reflux, I have acid reflux, I have GERD, uh, and so forth. Um, how does this occur and why does this occur? So just to be clear, uh, Transient relaxations of the sphincter at the GE junction are very common. Uh, they're natural, and most of us have them many times a day, and that's fine. That's how God intended it. But when you have a pathologic reflux, that's when uh, problems start. So in the normal state, uh, the GE junction uh, is here with the LES, the lower esophageal sphincter, is closed uh, appropriately for the majority of the time, and when the food bolus presents, as I discussed earlier, it'll open up and, and then let the food pass or the water pass, and then it'll close up back again. When this sphincter gets relaxed, um, uh, you know, the, the acid content or, or food content in the stomach has the opportunity to come back up through uh, this area into the esophagus and create uh, symptoms. So that's the pathologic state. And uh, obviously, once it's uh, degenerated, relaxed, or post-operatively, or whatever mechanisms there are, which we'll talk about, uh, then it doesn't have the capacity to cinch down again and, and uh, form the gateway that it's supposed to be. Uh, so as I discussed, the normal physiology and normal anatomy does allow for transient relaxations of the lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, and also in response to certain, uh, uh, when you eat and in response to certain food items, uh, the sphincter will relax more uh, and, uh, and create uh, more reflux. Uh, but there's also anatomic abnormalities. For example, uh, patients who've had local uh, endoscopic or surgical interventions or, or diseases that affect the, the sphincter uh, function uh, anatomically or mechanically, that can affect uh, the degree of reflux and the duration of reflux. Uh, and obviously, all the, think of it as all the good things in life you like, you know, chocolate, orange juice, you know, peppermint, chewing gum, uh, carbonated beverages, anything that you like, uh, mostly is on the list. Um, <laughs> so, um, and as we go down the list in clinic with patients, they'll be like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, this is not good. Um, so medications as well, there's a lot of uh, medications, especially the, some of the cardiac medications that will relax the sphincters and so forth and create uh, a, a, a more tendency for reflux. So what are the symptoms? So most of the patients, you know, uh, are supposed to come and tell you that I have this uh, acid uh, coming up through the chest and in the esophagus, I have this so-called heartburn sensation, uh, food is just regurgitating back, but many of the patients may not tell you that. Uh, they may present with atypical chest pain, they may present with pressure sometimes, which of course we have to rule out cardiac etiologies, uh, but they may also present with dysphagia, which is the difficulty to swallow. Uh, when the lower part of the food pipe gets significantly irritated or inflamed, uh, the patients can develop uh, uh, mechanical scarring from the inflammation, which can lead to dysphagia. But even without the mechanical scarring, there can be a sensation of pain on swallowing uh, and, and difficulty swallowing as the food bolus comes through that inflamed territory. So that can be a common symptom. Uh, patients can have chronic cough from uh, persistent uh, acid reflux, especially nocturnal or uh, nightly reflux. Uh, they can have a hoarse voice. Uh, there's a variant of asthma that can be uh, attributed to uh, untreated, undiagnosed reflux. So uh, the spectrum is pretty wide, uh, wide-ranging, and 
especially in tertiary referral practices where patients have been everywhere and have been undiagnosed or suboptimally treated, the, uh, the patient will typically not uh, speak about classic heartburn. There will be other issues because the classic heartburn patient has been taken care of at the primary care level uh, that doesn't, doesn't become a clinical conundrum. So very wide spectrum. So treatment. Uh, this is something that's important not just for, for you as, as an audience, as a group, but also for us as providers and, as, uh, and for trainees and for, and for younger uh, people in the field. I think it's easy to watch a TV ad or, or read a text, and an article or a study, uh, or have a clinical discourse and just start dishing out medications. But this is one disease that actually lends itself almost equally well to lifestyle modifications as it does to medical therapy, okay? So I can't tell you how many times I find patients who've, you know, I, either taking medications suboptimally or at the wrong time uh, in relation to food, uh, but particularly who are not following a lifestyle uh, change that uh, is, is almost mandatory for a good outcome. So we spend a lot of time counseling patients um, about uh, how to change their lifestyle, when to eat, uh, elevation of the head end of the bed, uh, avoiding certain foods that we referred to earlier on. And I think that's where a lot of the education comes into play. Uh, and those of you who are in the pharma side of things, I think this could be a prototype of a medical intervention where lifestyle education, patient awareness, patient education, and reiteration of those factors on a constant basis can be a very important tool. Obviously, uh, since when, when proton pump therapy, omeprazole, pantoprazole, they came around, uh, they really revolutionized the uh, management of acid reflux disease. And <clears throat> we know from studies that the rates of anti-reflux surgery went down, the complication rates from acid peptic disease went down, uh, and this really was a, a landmark event in, in modern medicine, uh, which really changed the outcome of acid-related diseases. But still, a uh, fair number of patients end up, uh, highly selected nature of patients will end up with uh, fundoplications or wrap, the so-called wrap around the GE junction to augment the GE junction. And now, actually, it's not on the slide, but uh, a well-established technique is the laparoscopic uh, links uh, a magnet device, which is placed laparoscopically without altering surgically the anatomy. Uh, it's made by a company called Torax, uh, which was recently bought over. Any questions on reflux? This is an important topic. I, you know, any burning questions? No. So tightly related with, with, with reflux disease, acid reflux disease, is esophagitis, which is uh, the consequence of uncontrolled, untreated, um, unbridled reflux. So this goes like this. Uh, grade A, B, and C, and D, this is the so-called Los Angeles classification. That's one of the ways of objectifying the degree of acid damage in the esophagus. So this here is the famous uh, GE junction we talked about so many times already. This is the lower end of the esophagus, uh, the tubular esophagus, they call it. And again, as you can note from picture A to D, the degree of inflammation is more and more and more significant. The degree of involvement of the circumference is more significant, and hence the classifications from A to D, without going too much into the detail. Now, this is Already bad news, this, if this patient is not treated well and optimally, they don't follow the dietary restrictions and, and lifestyle modifications, they're most, almost certainly going to end up uh, with further worsening, just like that large polyp that Betsy showed you is most likely going to end up with cancer. Some things are almost predictable, and this is one of them. A subsequent consequence of long-standing acid reflux disease, we believe, and there are a lot of other factors, genetics, familial, and others, uh, is the development of this condition, which is known as Barrett's esophagus. Now, if you remember earlier on um, in the morning, I suggested that the uh, esophageal lining is a very unique lining, the squamous epithelium. This is the condition in which that lining, due to a variety of factors, but primarily long-standing, unopposed exposure to acid, the tubular esophagus lining here will change into uh, a different type of lining, a specialized intestinal type of lining. So the same um, lining that will be in the intestine, in the duodenum, uh, more than likely that, that is the one that it transforms into here. I'm sorry. And 
once that is proven on a biopsy specimen, at least in the United States, with that endoscopic view and that biopsy showing an intestinal epithelium in the esophagus, you arrive at a diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus. Okay? So uh, uh, that's an important condition because there is a finite lifetime risk for developing esophageal cancer. Now, that varies based on which study you look at, uh, but it's roughly in the 0.1 to 0.4% per year uh, for those patients. Um, and the segment involvement of Barrett's can be small. It can be right at the GE junction only, or it can be all the way up uh, to the base of your tongue. I have several patients who have 20, 22 centimeters of Barrett's uh, who have been treated or not treated, depending on other factors, uh, and, and that can present a problem. Now, often these patients will not have any symptoms at this point because their lining, the, the lining change is actually nature's response uh, to uh, unopposed uh, acid reflux. So this particular lining is somewhat supposed to be less sensitive to pain and other symptoms that acid reflux patients present with. So just because patients have no symptoms doesn't mean uh, that they don't have ongoing reflux, uh, they may have transformed into Barrett's esophagus, and that may be confounding the, uh, the presentation a little bit. So the progression of Barrett's esophagus, which is important, uh, goes like this. Uh, this is your normal GE junction with the endoscopic view showing a nice tight uh, squamocolumnar junction. Down below there is the stomach. It then becomes into the specialized lining, which is visible um, at this stage, even with white light endoscopy, but uh, narrowband imaging, which is a specialized type of electronic chromoendoscopy, is able to show it a little bit more detail, uh, easier. And then you start developing uh, nodular areas in the Barrett's, which becomes more concerning. Um, and, and then finally, progression to uh, fairly overt cancer-like uh, mass-like uh, areas. Over here, if you see the pathology correlates, uh, normal squamous epithelium converts into these almost capillary-like glands, which is the intestinal uh, epithelium. At that point, the definition is Barrett's esophagus. And then it transfers into low-grade dysplasia, which is the next level of cell disorganization. And then the next level from there is high-grade dysplasia, which is even more chaotic-looking cells. Um, almost on the verge of forming cancer. And then you start developing a, an entity known as intramucosal cancer, which is cancer within the top lining of the food pipe. And then from there you get into invasive cancer, which goes through the wall, and then metastatic cancer. So it's a very well-defined pathway that uh, we want to arrest, ideally at this level, um, as we say that acid reflux is probably the most important long-standing risk factor, but there are a variety of other um, uh, demographic and, and, and genetic and other factors that play into it. It's not as simple as just every patient has acid reflux will get Barrett's. That doesn't happen. Otherwise, we'd be doing nothing else except Barrett's endoscopy. Um, so, uh, but, but in those patients who are genetically predispositioned to this, uh, this will occur. And obviously, uh, many of the people here as faculty, we deal a lot of these patients in our referral practices. This is an important diagnosis uh, from many aspects, but also from the aspect of the fact that we can actually prevent progression at this level by treating early dysplasia, and um, in very, very, very select patients, we can treat non-dysplastic Barrett's, but in general, we restrict treatment to dysplastic patients. And even when we have nodules, we can actually resect them and perform endoscopic resections that can actually be curative uh, and prevent major surgery like esophagectomy. So it's an important area that has really evolved in the last roughly about 10, 12 years. Um, and it's an area that uh, you will uh, you know, read more about and see more literature on in the, in the coming years. So uh, endoscopic treatment of Barrett's, this is one of the New England Journal articles from I think 2009, if I'm not wrong. Um, that uh, really set the stage for uh, endoscopic ablation to be uh, recognized, established, paid for, reimbursed. So this is radiofrequency ablation, which is one form of endoscopic ablation of dysplastic Barrett's. There is now a couple other platforms which are uh, also available. Uh, cryotherapy is one of them. There's two forms of cryotherapy that are available. One is a spray-based, one is balloon-based. Uh, so. Uh, 
uh, that's uh, available now in conjunction with endoscopic resection techniques. So after you do the ablation uh, with radio frequency energy, this is how the esophagus looks, and that's okay. It's a very superficial burn, and as the esophagus heals up, it will then supposedly and predictably almost heal up in a more squamous uh, type of epithelium. And, and these response rates are very durable um, in, in, in the majority of patients. <clears throat> This is what I mentioned is the endoscopic resection. So again, similar to a polypectomy, one type of resection involves uh, injecting um, uh, saline or other solution and then using a cap device at the end of the scope uh, to perform suction of the tumor or the lesion or the nodule and then resecting it at the base with cautery. Other devices include band ligation uh, based uh, resections. Um, and uh, so that's pretty commonly practiced as well, and for the most part is extremely safe. So that was the reflux, esophagitis, Barrett's type of uh, section of this particular slide set. Now moving on to some other disease variants. Uh, esophageal dysmotility is actually, in my opinion, uh, uh, one of the more underdiagnosed, underrecognized entities in the realm of esophageal uh, pathology. Uh, these are those patients who really don't have classic reflux, and that's not their problem. Uh, they have difficulty swallowing, and they can have difficulty swallowing solids, uh, solids and liquids, or only liquids, or they may have a variety of other symptoms like odynophagia, which is pain on swallowing, atypical chest pain or chest pressure, and they've had, you know, like 10 EKGs, 5 echoes, in some cases many angiograms, and their heart is fine. Which, by the way, we have to make every effort to make sure somebody comes with chest pain, chest pressure, uh, in 1 to 10 causes 1 to 9 are heart-related. So we have to make sure that, that we have done our due diligence. We send many patients back who have not seen a cardiologist and are of an appropriate age group. Go check your heart out first and then come back to me because that's what's going to kill them. This is not. So it's an important subset of diseases that uh, this uh, set talks about. So one of the things we see is when patients come with difficulty swallowing, um, typically, traditionally, many of them will have many endoscopies. They go from doctor to doctor. Um, they get scoped. In some cases, they get dilated or by a balloon or by a, by a, by a bougie. And they'll have a, maybe a, a placebo-type effect, and they'll have some relief, and then they'll come back with the same symptoms. So what these patients really need as the next step after a negative endoscopy is a pressure testing test, which is known as esophageal manometry. And nowadays, we have this high-resolution manometry setup that is, uh, gives us very reproducible results, which are reliable. So keep that in mind. A patient with difficulty swallowing, endoscopy is fantastic. Barium swallow, this is a radiographic study. But if those are negative, they don't get your answer. You need to move on to uh, pressure testing. And what does pressure testing do for us? It gives us, in many cases, a very specific diagnosis. So achalasia is one of them. Um, obviously, many of you may have heard about it because of the recent uh, discussion around POEM, which I'll talk about. Uh, nutcracker esophagus and diffuse spasms uh, are two uh, distinct entities. Uh, in many cases, they do respond to medical therapy. Um, but even if sometimes uh, uh, some, some of these conditions don't respond optimally, it's important for the patient to know what they're dealing with. It's important for their providers to know what they're dealing with uh, so that there can be an end to this uh, uh, kind of a non, uh, <clears throat> non-stop uh, cycle of testing, presentation, testing, endoscopy, dilation, and so forth. Um, systemic sclerosis is, uh, is a systemic condition in uh, scleroderma in which esophagus does get involved and has a very classic... Um, uh, pressure measurement path pattern, which is important. And these patients really have a hard time because their esophagus is really kind of burnt out, so to speak, um, and doesn't do its job well. So talk a little bit about achalasia. This is one of those conditions where somebody asked me earlier, does the esophagus store food? This is one of those conditions that literally does store food because it becomes like a bag. Uh, this esophagus looks like a sigmoid colon, and that's one of the... One of the uh, technical uh, ways of describing one of these dilated mega esophagus situations. Uh, the sphincter is the problem here. It doesn't relax fully. But also an equal important uh, issue is that the, uh, the esophagus is not doing that coordinated function of movement, which we talked about. So over a period of time, this is what happens. And this is a fairly classic picture of achalasia. And this is the kind of pictures that are on the GI boards. And the fellows are expected to uh, pick that up 
So there is a functional and mechanical obstruction of the esophagus, and that needs to be fixed. Uh, in the older population, the safest intervention uh, in all of achalasia really is injection of Botox. But like in life, you know, you get what you pay for. So Botox is basically a very temporary uh, in, you know, uh, investment, a um, couple, three weeks. I've seen patients who go out a year, typically an older patient. Uh, but this can be safely done. Um, it doesn't have too many side effects. It is a toxin, though, so you have to talk to patients about the allergic reaction potential, but I've never seen one. Uh, so that's one of the easier ones. Uh, pneumatic dilatation is balloon dilatation of the sphincter, but this is not any ordinary balloon. As far as I remember, short of the obesity balloons, this is the largest balloon in endoscopy. Okay, It's about 30 millimeters is the smallest one. It goes to 35 and then 40. Big balloon. It gets real hard, and it's full of air when you inflate it. So the idea there is to do what they call a controlled tear of the muscle of the lower esophageal sphincter, except that, as my partner says, when the balloon goes up, the in, <laughs> balloon is in charge, not you. Um, so mostly the, the tears are controlled, uh, but there is a well-defined perforation rate, which in the old literature goes all the way up to about 5 to 7%. Um, but uh, again, uh, touch wood, we haven't seen that in, in, modern, uh, in modern experience, but uh, uh, this is a very effective treatment. The, the literature does support it as a fairly durable endoscopic intervention. But the key point here is the balloon dilatation should primarily be done in those patients who will be able to tolerate an emergency thoracotomy, although nowadays you should be able to close many esophageal perforations endoscopically. Uh, but this should not be a patient who is, you know, unable to tolerate any degree of uh, emergency surgery. Which brings us to surgery. So this has been kind of the a mainstay of uh, achalasia treatment over the years. Uh, this is a myotomy that's created uh, laparoscopically, typically. Um, fairly straightforward uh, procedure for most advanced laparoscopic surgeons or thoracic surgeons or foregut surgeons. Uh, but uh, more recently, uh, we have had now this uh, intervention known as POEM, which is per oral endoscopic esophageal myotomy, which is the scope goes in, it uh, uh, creates a submucosal tunnel in the, in the esophagus uh, using different uh, fluids uh, that are injected. And then you put a cap on the scope and you go inside that tunnel and your goal is to reach uh, the muscle layer like such and then start incising the muscle layer about eight to 10 centimeters above the GE junction. So make a really long cut and remember, you're working inside the wall of the esophagus. So this is really novel. And this is really what gave birth to what we call now is third space endoscopy. The first space being the esophagus and stomach lumen. Second space being the biliary tract, pancreas. Third space being this area here. So poem. So you'll be seeing a lot more discussion on this in the coming years as well as long-term data emerges. It, it seems to work pretty much as well as as, as a balloon or surgery, but uh, the criticism is that it's relatively early still, and there's only a few centers anywhere in the world that have really developed a certain degree of proficiency with it, and um, more, of, uh, more of that to come. Moving on to peptic ulcer disease, which is uh, far more common than uh, achalasia. Um, so peptic ulcer disease is basically ulcers that are created in the acid environment. Um, there is breaks in the gastrointestinal tract, and the common locations are in the stomach and the intestine. Again, they lead to a lot of grief, uh, you know, bleeding, perforation, abdominal pain. These are the two causes associated with peptic ulcers, H. pylori infection, especially in the, in the second and third world. Um, in India, for example, it's almost 80 to 90 percent uh, prevalence rates. And then, of course, in the developed world, we have uh, painkillers. We, uh, pa we love our painkillers. So, uh, Motrin, NSAIDs, uh, you name it, uh, especially in the elderly. So a lot of misery related to peptic ulcer disease. Um, as I mentioned, bleeding, um, which could be, you know, overt bleeding or just dark stools, nausea and vomiting from deformed anatomy related to scar tissue from healing, and then, of course, acute perforation. It still occurs despite uh, the, as I said earlier, the era of uh, proton pump therapy has significantly reduced this, this uh, presentation, but we still see occasionally patients who are at impending perforation or have come into the ER with, with perforation. These are patients who have not received good care for a long time. So an upper endoscopy um, you know, reveals an ulcer like such, 
This is an ulcer that would be described as a clean-based ulcer. Maybe we could say it has a pigmented spot, but uh, not much therapy is required here. And then treatment for that is if, uh, you know, every patient who has peptic ulcer disease should have H. pylori tested, which is a biopsy test typically at the time of endoscopy, or you can do a stool-based test, or you can do a breath test. There's many ways to do it. And then once an ulcer is diagnosed, uh, you, the patient should be on PPI therapy. The question comes is how long should they be on it and so forth. That's a matter of uh, case-specific uh, discussion. Um, but some patients who present with very severe complications, uh, the recommendation is to, uh, to stay on it for life, <clears throat> especially elderly patients who are going to be on NSAIDs and such. So bleeding from the upper GI tract uh, is, is a, quite a common uh, phenomenon. Um, and again, patients can come in vomiting blood or they can pass blood in the stools. Uh, two different uh, technical uh, terms that are used for that. This pointer is so hematemesis is the vomiting, and hematochesia is the bright red blood from the rectum. And then there is uh, lesser acute presentations, as I mentioned here. Very common, almost, you know, at least half of our 15 to 20 consults a day on the inpatient side are related to bleeding in some form. Uh, very, very common diagnosis, uh, something you should be familiar with. And these are the pathologic variants that will create. So varices are dilated blood vessels, typically found in liver patients, as you saw earlier. Erosions can be seen with, uh, with Motrin and Advil use. This here is portal gastropathy, which is related to liver disease as well. There's a congestion of the portal system. Here's another ulcer with a, with a pretty deep ulcer, actually, and uh, uh, with a clean base. Mallory Weiss tear is a, is a tear in the esophagus uh, from uh, so-called, uh, you can say, reverse peristalsis or, or, or uh, retching. Uh, this is a very specific uh, uh, entity known as gave gastric antral vascular ectasia. So remember the antrum, which is the location in the distal stomach. Uh, this is also known as watermelon stomach because it does look like one. Gastric varices are very, very fearsome because if they bleed, endoscopic options still are relatively limited in the urgent setting, and these patients need needs to go to a tapes type shunt or some other intervention. And then this, of course, is a classic arteriovenous malformation, which are again common in patients who are older, dialysis patients, patients with left ventricular assist devices. Uh, so very, very common entities that can lead to bleeding. The management of bleeding we always talk about is uh, first stabilize the patient. And this is also one of the board questions in GI and GI boards is, you know, patient comes in, you stabilize them, make sure their vitals are okay, they get fluids, they get packed RBCs or, or plasma if their coagulopathy is there. And then finally, of course, uh, institute the right medical therapy and endoscopic therapy as, as required depending on uh, what the problem at hand is. So you learned earlier about the tools so this is the endoscopic interventions that we can perform, um, a wide variety of them. You can inject epinephrine. Uh, you can provide thermal therapies with this uh, uh, cautery probe here. There's many types available. Endoclips have, again, one, one intervention that have revolutionized endoscopic therapy uh, for the last almost two decades. And you can perform band ligation, uh, as Dr. Rodriguez showed earlier, for varices, which is very effective. Moving on to another entity, gastric outlet obstruction. Basically, it's a mechanical obstruction of the stomach, um, which prevents uh, you know, transfer of food and material from the stomach into the intestine. And this can be from two types. One can be benign uh, from ulcer disease, as we discussed earlier. And then the other one can be malignant from, typically from either a pancreatic cancer or gastric cancer or duodenal cancer. And uh, the approach is a little bit different for both of them. Uh, this is uh, something I hope you never get to see. Uh, we'll just skip that. Uh, <laughs> symptoms. So symptoms, as you can expect, uh, uh, from gastric outlet obstruction are, are basically those that are related to fullness, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. It's like a clogged sink. So, uh, and many of these patients, uh, if they have chronic insidious obstruction, especially related to peptic ulcer disease, they'll lose weight, they're not able to eat much, they naturally adjust to eating small frequent meals rather than, and than uh, full caloric intakes. This is how their CT scans look, and this is how their endoscopy looks. So the channel is significantly reduced. And then, of course, the most appropriate initial intervention is to drain their stomach uh, with using an NG tube. 
and, and prevent the risk for aspiration before you even go and do an endoscopy, and that's pretty standard uh, over there. For malignant obstruction, we have the capability now to put uh, uh, stents, which are self-expanding metal stents, across from the stomach on the one side and well into the duodenum. Uh, these are not that difficult to place for people who do this a lot, and they're really tremendously effective in the relatively short lifespan that these patients have left to live and have obviated the need for surgery. So this is how it looks. Surgery, of course, is still done in some benign conditions and occasionally done by the surgeon when they go down to operate for definitive surgery and they find that they can't do a pancreatic resection, for example, and they'll, uh, they'll have four hours or five hours of their OR time blocked out, so they'll end up doing a, <laughs> a palliative gastrogenostomy, uh, knowing fully well that we would have been able to put a stent if needed. But um, that is something that is beyond my control. Um, gastroparesis, I think this is one of the last ones, is delayed um, emptying of the stomach um, from a variety of causes, the most common being idiopathic, which is uh, no causes found in about 40-45% of patients. Uh, but diabetes is the next big one, and then post-surgical uh, complications, a gastrectomy or some type of intervention uh, where the vagus nerve is disturbed can also create that. Again, the same type of symptoms, bloating, abdominal discomfort, um, and so forth, early satiety, which means you, you feel full very quickly after a meal compared to five years ago. And these, these can be relatively easily diagnosed with gastric emptying studies, which are uh, very good and easily available nowadays. And you can make a diagnosis and then provide some therapy, which is limited. I think this is one area on the pharma side that we can certainly use some help. Uh, back in the day, we had more options, but for one reason or another, the FDA came down heavy on those. Uh, we now have a safe option, which is erythromycin, which is normally an antibiotic, as you know. And then we have a slightly more risky option, metoclopramide, which can have some neurological irreversible side effects. I have not seen one yet, but it is very possible and very real. And then, of course, we have the option of doing gastric pacemaker, which hasn't quite taken off, uh, unlike the cardiac pacemaker. Um, so uh, we don't still have gastric pacing as a well-established, uh, durable, reliable intervention for this condition. Um, finishing up with submucosal masses or subepithelial lesions and endoscopy, you can see these bumps and lumps. This is a common referral for endoscopic ultrasound because when you biopsy the top of these surfaces, you can't really get the diagnosis. So a variety of things can lead to this. Leomyoma is a muscle tumor. Uh, ectopic pancreas uh, at the time of development can, can, you know, piece of pancreas come in the stomach. That's how that looks. Fatty lumps, lipomas, and then some type of uh, pre-malignant condition. So these are very common entities um, as a whole, and they can be further evaluated with endoscopic ultrasound as shown here. And in many cases, uh, sampling can be done with fine needle aspiration which can arrive at a diagnosis, and then you take it from there. That's it. Thank you very much. Questions? Maybe. I just want to make a comment about the, um, the RFA, the radiofrequency ablation of Barrett's esophagus. I think that is a very nice example of where industry changed the world for these patients, okay? Prior to, to that being available, if patients started developing dysplasia in their Barrett's esophagus, right, it's starting to turn on them, starting to turn into cancer, they had to get an esophagectomy, all right, take out the esophagus, they bring up the stomach and attach it to the stump. It was a horrible operation. They do not do well after. And I, I mean, I don't even remember last time I had a patient get an esophagectomy. Now we remove these bumps with the bander and then we can RFA the rest and it's been a huge game changer. So like I, I just, just thinking that that was a really nice example of uh, industry really changing things for patients. Yep, and many, many such. Uh, yeah. Okay. Look good. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep.